Hello, everyone, and welcome to a Getting to Know Japan webinar, a new Getting to Know Japan webinar. Thank you for joining us, and a big thank you to our program sponsors, the Japan Foundation New York, for funding this series, enabling us to put this on each week. Today, we are joined by Professor Jorge Amanzan, who will be presenting on learning from Tokyo's emergent urbanism. Professor Jorge Almanzan is an architect based in Tokyo and an associate professor at Keio University. After graduating from the Architecture School of the Polytechnic University of Madrid, he obtained his PhD at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. His office, Jorge Almanzan Architects, is committed to environmentally responsible and socially inclusive projects. His awarded architectural designs for urban regeneration include the first prize of the Ota City Urban Landscape Award in 2019 and the Japan Institute of Architects Excellent Award in 2018 and 2022. He recently published, published Emergent Tokyo Designing the Spontaneous City in 2021 and its Japanese version in 2022. Professor Almanzan, it is a pleasure to have you with us here today. I'll let you take it from here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Amani. And uh, well, I also want to thank, uh, of course, the Yokosuka Council on Asia Pacific Studies for inviting me today. Um, I'm going to talk uh, um, about uh, 30 minutes and let's see if I can share my screen correctly. Is it showing now? Yes, perfect. Okay. So um, the title of my presentation is Learning from Tokyo's Emergent Urbanism. And I will explain uh, in detail, maybe this word emergent is not known for everyone, but um, before explaining this, um, let me introduce you um, uh, through some images, the kind of work that I have been doing in, in Japan. Uh, although my main field of studies has been um, Tokyo, uh, in reality, most of my work has been done in the countryside, in regional Japan, and uh, very often uh, also related to interventions and public space. Uh, um, I have been also working on uh, some renovations and some work in, in rather central Tokyo, but um, I think it's important for me to, to emphasize the fact that many of uh, the uh, kind of theories or kind of the um, knowledge or the studies they have been conducting, they also have uh, 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 or originate um, in, in these uh, more practical experiences. The fact of you know, uh, trying to build something in Japan is uh, quite complicated as you can imagine. So it's not just uh, um, from let's say theoretical or just from books. Uh, from those kind of sources. Um, yeah, but let me uh, go to or start with uh, the, the book, uh, um, which is the main topic of tonight. Emerging Tokyo Design in the Spontaneous City is the title in, in English. Um, and on the right uh, is the Japanese version, Tokyo no so hatsuteki Um well, in this title, um, I'm trying to kind of um, identify uh, which are, let's say, the most um, interesting or the most exciting features of Tokyo, which uh, um, make it different from other cities, but at the same time uh, could be explained or could be, let's say, exported or could be applied to other cities. And I think in that sense, uh, for me, it was very important to introduce a, com uh, um, a concept from complexity science um, in which, uh, um, you know, I don't know if you are familiar with complexity science, but uh, it's about uh, how we can explain things uh, which uh, doesn't seem to be, in principle, seem to lack order, seem to be like chaotic systems, but in reality, there are hidden orders. And uh, I think it was very interesting for me to uh, introduce these kind of concepts because uh, very often Tokyo is uh, considered as a kind of jungle of chaos, right? But uh, I am completely against this idea 
although I believe that uh, we cannot explain the kind of order that we can that we find in Tokyo through uh, the same kind of language that we, we apply to, uh, let's say, for example, Western cities, cities like, I don't know, Paris, Barcelona, or, or Berlin, for example. So uh, I would like to introduce the concept of emergence now. Emergence is the creation of uh, order and functionality from the bottom up. Uh, the classical example would be the flocking behavior of birds. When we look at birds, they create these kind of amazing formations that allow them to fly uh, faster than what they would, uh, or each of them independently would be able to fly. Uh, and and this is not these formations are not created because there is a kind of leading bird. This guy here is not leading the flock, right? We know that because the flock moves dynamically and they change that the the bird on the on the on the tip of the arrow changes frequently. So what is going on here is that uh, through uh, local orders, through uh, things like uh, the speed between birds. Or, uh, or the, the distance between birds or, or the speed, they managed to create as a whole just by following local rules, just by following local interactions. Those local interactions, those micro interactions create an overall order that is much more than the sum of, of its parts. And I think pretty much the same is happening in Tokyo. I think we can understand uh, one of the most or, or some of the, the the most amazing spaces in Tokyo through this com through this concept of emergence. And um, well, the book addresses uh, several cases or uh, several patterns, as I call them, urban patterns, uh, which uh, from my viewpoint are the most representative, are the most kind of clear. But of course, we could um, extract or we could find many other uh, cases. Uh, I cannot address all of them. Maybe I can, in the question time, I can um, maybe uh, give some more details. But uh, those five patterns are the Yokocho alleyways. The Yokocho are kind of uh, small uh, bars or micro bars, uh, um, uh, alleyways or alleys with uh, very small restaurants and bars. The Zakyo buildings, Zakyo are multi-tenant, kind of uh, uh, vertical or, or, or buildings with uh, multi-story buildings, under tracking fields, as you know, or you might know that there are like lots of um, elevated infrastructure and very often they are filled or they are kind of used in a very efficient way, interesting way. Ankyo streets, Ankyo means something like covered streets. That's another interesting case and dense low rise neighborhoods. Today, I'm going to just address the top three ones, but if you are interested, I can maybe later add more details. This is a map of the 23 central wards of Tokyo. Tokyo is a prefecture, it's bigger than what this map shows, but for me, it was very interesting to plot those patterns in order to show that there are certain distributions, cert certain logic, and they are not just exceptional or weird uh, kind of cases uh, exceptionally found, but they are actually something that you can find across the 23 uh, wards of Tokyo. Let me start with the Yokocho alleyways, because I believe they are almost like the purest case um, of, of urban emergence. I don't know if you are familiar with this kind of compounds. Um, maybe uh, if uh, some of you have been to Tokyo as a tourist, um, I'm almost sure that you have visited this place. This is a uh, golden guy in Shinjuku because it's becoming now so popular among tourists. It's really full of tourists now. When I first arrived in Japan, it was, uh, wow, it was like 20 years ago. Uh, there were almost no tourists here, but but I found it really interesting, really fascinating. And it seemed like this kind of fascination is now shared by my, many more people. Uh, these are uh, This is a compound. This is a small uh, um, block uh, to give you just um, an idea. This is almost like half of a soccer field, more or less. 
In this small surface, there are more than there are more than 250 small bars. So probably this is the uh, the the world's densest bar, bar district. Um, everything is about smallness, of course. It's super compact. Uh, in some streets, uh, you can almost uh, touch with both hands. If you extend both hands, you can teach. You can touch um, uh, the streets. Uh, they are, as you can see, very animated, very lively. And the equivalent of uh, that bird that I was talking, no? the equivalent of the, that small actor, a small independent actor that contributes in an emergent way to create the whole will be the, the micro bar in this case. I'd say micro because it's really small. The book is full of uh, drawings and analysis with uh, architectural drawings where you can see the actual um, dimensions. In this case, these dimensions are in millimeters. So this is 6.7 uh, meters and 2.4 uh, meters uh, wide. And as you can see, they are really, really tiny, really, really small. Uh, but still, uh, we conducted or we have conducted uh, very often interviews with the owners and they found this smallness um, efficient. They found this smallness attractive because they can manage their spaces by themselves. They can customize it. They are free. Uh, they don't have the kind of limitations that uh, they would face if they were in a franchise or in a chain store, right? They are completely free to develop their own atmosphere, their own kind of drinks, their own kind of community. Very often, each bar corresponds to a certain kind of people, like people who like movies, people who like uh, cinema, people who like theater, kind of um, very often like culture-related uh, spaces. And uh, it's very economical because it's uh, the space is very small, uh, so the rental prices are relatively small, but still they are in a great uh, central location. This is probably the smallest one that I managed to, found, to find. Uh, is in uh, Yanagi Koji on the Chuo line, uh, Nishiogi Kubo Station. And uh, in this case, it's managed or is owned by a Greek chef. Uh, who well he is 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 a, a you know a young entrepreneur uh, who uh, arrived recently in Tokyo and he's trying to open his own restaurant and this is a, a very a, a kind of great way to have access to a clientele and to have access to a, a certain market in a very small surface so I, I believe these uh, small bars as kind of incubators for new ideas new chefs new new. Uh, um, kind of um, or original approaches uh, in many cases uh, to this uh, type of business. But for me, the most interesting effect is when we look at how they interact or how they work together. Mm -hmm. um, as a whole, as you can see uh, in these kind of drawings, we are kind of analyzing the city through these kind of sectional drawings. And I, I think it's interesting that these bars, they compete with each other because they want you know, they want to attract the same clients, but also as a whole, when we see them as a totality, as a compound, they are uh, attracting uh, lots of uh, uh, clients to the place and they are creating, and therefore each of them can benefit also from this uh, capacity of being an urban magnet. And they are creating uh, a kind of um, what economists call a, a, an economy of agglomeration. It means um, it's, it's an economy uh, which uh, uh, manages to be very efficient and very um, competitive, not by making uh, larger and larger productions of things, that would be the economies of scale, but by creating agglomerations of businesses in a certain area where they compete and they collaborate also, and they manage to create these kind of uh, synergies uh, between small uh, businesses. Usually most creative um, kind of uh, businesses are based on this kind of urban situations of uh, economies of agglomerations, uh, economies of, uh, <clears throat> of agglomeration. And in this case, I, I would say it's a kind of microeconomy of agglomeration. No? This, so it has, although um, in many cases, these kind of uh, small spaces or kind of small buildings are considered like uh, very dirty, old, um, in many cases, uh, many Japanese researchers don't consider them as proper architecture or proper urbanism. I believe they have uh, many advantages. 
And uh, well, another example of uh, a kind of building which you will see all around Tokyo, but in most cases, uh, they are considered unsightly. They are considered in many cases dangerous. They are not really appreciated. Are the Zakyo buildings? This is kind of the uh, probably one of the most uh, uh, famous uh, facades, urban facades in uh, Tokyo uh, is in uh, Yasukuni uh, Avenue, very close to Shinjuku. And I think it's famous because in all the movies, all the American movies that you can see from superheroes and Wolverine and Kill Bill, uh, you name it, Lost in Translation, uh, all, every, all the American heroes and protagonists that come to Japan, they always somehow have to cross and appear uh, with this background of these uh, Zakyo buildings in Yasukuni Street. And I think this is a proof of the fact that they are very iconic. They are buildings which are kind of visually very strong, powerful, although in the touristic kind of brochures and the information that you get from Japan, usually um, they are not featured. They tend to send to show like Tokyo Tower, other things, no? So it's a kind of monument, non-recognized or emergent uh, monument, uh, I believe. But for me, the most interesting thing is how to how they work uh, inside. And uh, uh, the, the, the way they work is pretty much like a verticalized Yokochon. They work as a kind of vertical street, uh, which um, is favored or is um, enhanced by the fact that uh, in Japan, most of the plots are quite narrow. So when they grow, they have to grow upwards. And uh, very often uh, the, escalate, the, the elevator or the stairs are connected directly to the street without any kind of lobby. So you can have like a direct connection, almost like a verticalized yoko chain, which on each building, on each floor, you have very often a different, um, different business. And this also creates a kind of verticalized economy of agglomeration, which makes, uh, um, you know, allows uh, the incubation of uh, new and, and less, let's say, conventional types of businesses. It's very interesting also to see how flexible uh, these uh, Zakyo buildings are. This is a record uh, from the 50s, uh, 1950s to uh, recently, uh, of what was going on inside the buildings. And um, well, uh, basically we can summarize these transformations in this graph here, in which you can see that at the beginning they were office buildings, basically, and then slowly they transform into uh, other things like restaurants, recreation, etc. So we see this capacity of adapt, adaptation through time. And we know, for example, now that uh, through the pandemic, after the pandemic, many office buildings are now in trouble because uh, people don't want to go back. They kind of discover that they can work online. So now there is a huge issue, like what to do with office buildings. And I think Zakyo buildings are an example of how they can be flexible. They can be an office building for a certain period and then slowly change into restaurants, into retail, in a kind of situation which is not very common in the West, in which you can have like completely different kind of businesses stuck on, on top of each other, right? As you can see, it's like very diverse colors, very diverse uses. And uh, the, the same kind of logic also can, uh, uh, or also happens um, uh, for uh, uh, these kind of spaces. Uh, this is, uh, as I was mentioned at the beginning, an elevated um, uh, infrastructure. Uh, this is uh, Ueno, uh, Ueno Station. This is the famous Ameyoko, Ameyoko Market or Ameyoko Street. Uh, and here uh, we can see a situation which in many of, uh, well, European and uh, cities or North American cities, is tends to be like dark, dangerous kind of spaces, no? the spaces that you tend to find under viaducts or under uh, uh, highways, elevated highways, or under elevated railways, usually they create boundaries between neighborhoods. They tend to be noisy, dirty, very often dangerous. But through this process of allowing a kind of almost in an emergent self-organized way, uh, allowing small businesses to uh, colonize those spaces, we found or we can find that rather than barriers between neighborhoods, they can become almost like magnets. In fact, Ameyoko 
over the last uh, 60 or 70 years has been a continuously lively place that still people like and tourists and locals go to enjoy. And rather than a barrier, it's becoming like a, a, an element that unites uh, and, and makes easy for people to gather and, 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 and to communicate and, and create this kind of feeling of uh, shared space. And for me, maybe the key for creating these kind of spaces is what I call urban permeability. This is one of the secrets, I believe, of the success of these spaces in Tokyo. So permeability is the capacity of spaces to allow the public to cross through or to see inside is the, the, the degree to which the boundary between the interior and exterior is porous or permeable. And we can see that many of the pre-war under track spaces, like the one in Ueno, um, those were constructed up before the war, and many of them have been colonized by these, these small businesses and small restaurants, and they are kind of very open to the exterior. We can also see that in the 60s and 70s, um, they were created or they were creating more and more of this elevated infrastructure. And again, they were following this model of the um, of, a, let's say, traditional uh, shopping street. And they were kind of giving uh, freedom to independence, independent owners to open their businesses to the outside. But we can see that in the 80s and 90s, uh, the model changed. And uh, the model was the shopping center. So very often, as you can see in this image, uh, uh, the new under track infills were built with just without uh, uh, windows, without openings, just one entrance, and then all the circulation was uh, internalized. Of course, that uh, kills the liveliness of the street. And, uh, and this is not a positive uh, model, I think. Um, I believe not even for the business inside, for this shopping mall, because it could benefit from more uh, traffic of people. But of course, it's not beneficial for, for the city. And I think recently, uh, Japanese developers have learned the lesson. And uh, we can see now uh, many of the recent uh, infills, under track infills, like this one in Nakameguro, which are having or have been designed with this kind of permeable boundaries, no? like more transparent, more uh, allowing people to go inside and outside. So I think, you know, like recent developments seem to be in the right uh, direction. Um, we can see the, the enormous diversity. This is this Ameyoko Street. Well, this is one station, and this stretch is a stretch under the rail tracks, a really uh, diverse uh, with many kind of businesses. And again, this sense of permeability, you know, this sense of allowing people to cross through, not creating like boundaries, strong boundaries, and creating kind of uh, um, uh, more uh, ambiguous boundaries that allow people's activities and interaction. You know? These are uh, some of these uh, qualities that we can see in these kind of emergent spaces in Tokyo. So I think Tokyo offers almost like a landscape of different combinations. So, and I didn't, I didn't have time, or I don't have time to explain more, uh, of different possibilities of how this concept of emergence uh, can be applied in different situations, in different situations of low-rise uh, housing kind of uh, um, uh, situations, also like higher uh, um, uh, buildings, and also like difficult interstitial. Uh, spaces or gap spaces in the city that uh, tend to be problematic. And if I had to kind of summarize some of these principles that we can learn, not only for designing things in Tokyo, but also in other cities, I would summarize them maybe through these uh, five uh, principles. First of all, uh, the fact of having numerous owners and operators, this seems to be um, relatively, uh, um, well, uh, maybe uh, relatively easy to understand, but uh, in, in Tokyo and in many other cities, the fact of having many owners and many small plots is considered very often a problem, is considered a kind of a, 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 a kind of a difficulty in order to develop uh, higher buildings and bigger buildings 
but uh, I think it's one of the potentials of Tokyo, uh, having this kind of multiplicity of agents is a, is a one way to kind of foster this kind of emergent situation. Another is uh, the, that Tokyo, or this emergent urbanism succeeds through economies of agglomeration. Of course, those economies of agglomerations require rather smaller elements that interact uh, with each other uh, and create uh, those kind of more imaginative and more uh, creative situations. The other is the small scale, a scale which again is very often criticized not only by, by, by big developers, but also by authorities in Tokyo. Um, since I arrived and before I have read a lot about all the concerns, all the problems related with the small scale of buildings, the small scale of plots, but it might be also a potential. Of course, in some situations, we need the big buildings, but the small scale allows uh, the local communities and individuals to really control and to really uh, uh, appropriate their own spaces and be creative, be you know free to kind of develop their own businesses, their own ideas, their own kind of environment. So a small scale might be also a, a potential and not only a problem. Uh, the following point is the point of permeable and inclusive boundaries. We see in many uh, developments uh, all over the world how our buildings are becoming more, well, more exclusive in a, in a sense or exclusionary in the sense that uh, they are blank uh, facades or windowsless facades and all the circulations is internalized, inter, uh, internalized as a kind of the shopping mall kind of model. I think Tokyo's emergent urbanism shows the benefits of fostering permeable and inclusive boundaries to create lively streets. And uh, last uh, but not least, uh, I, I would say the, the principle of uh, letting the city evolve, uh, letting the pre-existing urban fabric grow in a bottom-up incremental way, uh, instead of, uh, as we see in many uh, recent developments in Tokyo, uh, instead of demolishing uh, big areas of the city, uh, when I say big, it's like several hectares, um, like uh, considerable, or I, I would say the several blocks, urban blocks, uh, without leaving any trace of the historical city, not even of the patterns of the street. I think uh, Tokyo shows that there is a way for our cities to grow in a more incremental way uh, so that we, we, should, we could not or we are not forced to give up on, on, you know, on the, uh, uh, many of the layers or the heritage that uh, previous uh, phases or previous periods are uh, living uh, in the current uh, city. And uh, yeah, I think, um, well, um, it's going to be a little bit shorter than I expected, but uh, that is uh, basically my presentation today. And uh, I'm more than happy to uh, respond to your questions. And if you have more interest, I can even, you know, like um, show you more slides. I have more additional slides if needed, but for the time being, I would like to finish uh, now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Almazan, for your, your awesome presentation. I, I just reading the chat, everyone is, has really enjoyed like the pictures, the diagrams that you show. Um, it's really interesting to see kind of, you know, Tokyo's architecture, but kind of like a bird's eye view, you know, kind of seeing within the, the various buildings and, and things like that. So it's really interesting. Thank um, you. So to start off with uh, the questions, um, I would like to ask a question. So. Can you speak a little bit about Tokyo's changing urban design? Because it seems like a lot of newer businesses, particularly cafes, restaurants, and even some office buildings are transitioning into this, like um, becoming very sleek, very minimal style. Um, there's a lot of concrete used. Like, in my opinion, it kind of takes away from the charm that is, you know, Tokyo. When you, some of the photos that you're showing, it's very bright, you know, um, and, and the stuff that you see, you know, that's used in the media. Why, why are we seeing this transition to this more very minimalist style? Do you think? Okay. Um, well, I think it's interesting that you call it a minimalist 
style um, because in fact i think it minimizes a little bit of the richness that or complexity you know that we can see in this kind of more emergent tokyo you know of course this kind of richness of space i would say maybe you find it charming might you might find it charming but among my Japanese colleagues, I uh, find it criticized very often. Um, I think there is a gap of understanding uh, between the, I would say, even the tourists or the foreigners, and even the the like popular classes, I would say, and and the I would say the elites who are in charge of the city. Um, so especially, I would say. Uh, now there is an increasing gap or there's a, almost like a dichotomy between, uh, let's say, the official uh, kind of development that authorities and the world of finance or the world of uh, the big developers are trying to, to uh, you know, foster and, and, and the, 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 the kind of Tokyo that kind of, as I mentioned, kind of grow, grew incrementally. So yeah, it's true. There is um, now uh, in Tokyo, uh, one of the most surprising things is that there, is, there are like so many new constructions, no? so many new towers, um, so many new buildings. It's almost like incredible because, um, you know, I think it's happening almost only in Tokyo in a, in, in a country which uh, as a tourist, the first thing, or as someone who doesn't know about Japan, the first, one of the first things of, of information pieces of information that you would find on the media is that Japan is a situation of uh, depopulation, uh, degrowth, pop uh, aging, right? But if you come to to Tokyo, it seems like it's almost like a, like um, a situation of a, of a country which is now growing, developing, etc. So I think there is a kind of very strange situation now uh, in which we see uh, this so many new buildings and so many redevelopments precisely in areas which are already successful. That's very, very mysterious. Uh, and I think I'm very critical of it. Uh, for example, Shibuya. Shibuya was an area that was, has been, uh, um, you know, like very successful commercially, uh, but we are seeing now a, a, a whole kind of redevelopment of Shibuya, for example, right? This is something that um, is kind of is a result of trying to create more value uh, from places that already have value. This is the the the, the logic, but I think it's um, it's a dangerous uh, kind of situation because from a certain level or from a certain degree, you start losing qualities. So I think scale is important. Uh, I think uh, if certain areas of Tokyo work very well, even if they have like higher buildings. But when everything is kind of these kind of super new redevelopments without follow that follow the shopping mall style, no, like blank facades, everything interiorized, no small scale, no independent buildings, only franchises only chain stores, then you start losing all these qualities, all this dynamism, all this creativity. And uh, you see like, you call it minimalist, but I would call it uh, a little bit probably like maybe a kind of corporate kind of uh, rather, um, uh, I would say like a standardized uh, kind of style, which contrasts with more the, the freedom that you find when you go to a cafe or a, or a bar in which obviously, you know, the guy or the bartender has been in charge or has been kind of customizing his own uh, space. No? So I think I agree completely with you. And I think it's a process that uh, although is supported by the political and economic elites of the city, I believe uh, slowly many of those elites also are starting to realize like, oh, wow, maybe we should slow down a little bit. Maybe we should reconsider or think strategically more what we are going to demolish and what not. And I see, I talk with my colleagues uh, in both in uh, developers and also architects and so on. And I think this feeling that you are having now 
is shared, is shared by many people. Thank you so much for answering my question. Um, and also thank you for correcting me as I'm in referring to it as standardized style. Um, I do want to also add additionally and ask, um, now that we are seeing more of this standardized style and it's kind of like juxtaposing or clashing with, um, you know, more older buildings, more, you know, buildings like, like you mentioned that the owner has been in charge for many, many years, is there pressure on those businesses to try to transform and compete with these new modern standardized buildings or um, you know, are, are we going to continue to see this kind of like, and here we have a, a newer building and here we have an older building and here we have a newer building kind of like situation for the future, do you think? Um, yeah, well, I think, um, um, well, Tokyo is always a city that is often described as a, a kind of um, city with a very strong contrast, no? With you, you can see, almost like um, uh, 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 ancient temple together with a very slick uh, glass and steel tower. I believe that a contrast is going to continue, of course, but I think that there is a, um, a very strong pressure um, from, from this wave of new and, and huge redevelopments. Um, take into consideration that a, this new wave of redevelopments are the result of um, eliminating many of the traditional rules that we had in urban planning. So in urban planning, uh, there are uh, regulations to limit the height of buildings, for example, or uh, to limit the, the number of the, the floor area, no? it's called the floor area ratio. So uh, this, kind of rush or redevelopment rush of inner city areas in Tokyo is not the result of just you know some random situation but is the result of a new regulatory or legal framework that for certain areas specific areas usually those who are better located more central in front of the uh, bigger stations the central government uh, has designated them as uh, what they call urban renaissance areas. And in those areas, almost uh, all the um, traditional rules uh, of urbanism have been eliminated, which means that uh, the developers can negotiate with local authorities. And we see situations in which in areas where the floor area ratio was, you know, certain amount, we see now that it's double or triple. So we see like a, a very uh, um, strange situation in which limitations for sunlight uh, or for uh, certain qualities of our own space have been eliminated. And now uh, you can build huge towers in places that until now were rather low rise. So of course, in that situation, uh, and in those central areas, which from the beginning were successful, no? uh, of course, uh, the profit that you can gain from those operations is huge. And therefore, it's even though Japanese are very attached to their land and they attach to their communities and their shotengai, their commercial street, etc., I believe that the 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 amount of the the the, the enormous profit uh, that those operations involve create a, an enormous uh, also pressure uh, to the individual owners. And of course, many of those owners of other buildings, et cetera, end up uh, kind of giving up and selling their land or uh, changing you know, uh, their small business uh, in exchange to, I don't know, having uh, some square meters in a tower. No? So we are seeing a process very, uh, very powerful in that sense, that is a kind of a putting a lot of pressure, but this is not everywhere. As I mentioned, it's, it's in certain areas, most of them, the most central areas of Tokyo. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, Vivian Ming asked, uh, is the permanentability um, an emergent design or does it arise because of building code requirements? For example, safety uh, requirements given 
that earthquakes are a thing here in Japan? Sorry, the beginning of the question was? Yes, is the permeability, permeability? A uh, permeability, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, is it an emergent design? Okay. Well, um, the, the subtitle of the book is Designing the Spontaneous City. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, emergency sounds like a self-organized system, almost like a, a system that uh, uh, without design. But in fact, uh, and this is the main point of, of the book, um, there are certain principles or there are like central uh, legal frameworks that allow uh, those things to happen. So, for example, in the case of the permeability, I believe that um, it is the result of both a, a certain conditions or preconditions, and also just because uh, um, the need to have access to, um, let's say, uh, the public space. No, I mean, when you have an independent business, uh, your 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 kind of um, you need to have like a permeable uh, uh, interface. Um, and uh, this is different when you have you are just a small stand or a small stall within a large shopping mall. No? That's a, a different situation. So uh, I don't think this is directly the permeability in itself is not directly the result of any, uh, for example, fire protection uh, regulation. It's rather the result of a configuration in which a, an agglomeration of small businesses really require this connection with the street is kind of almost natural for them to try to be as permeable as possible. I think that's a situation that happens in, in Japan, but also happens in um, in many, uh, I, for example, European cities, you know, European cities, that are the cities that I know also. Uh, it's very common to have like very permeable and porous and open uh, interfaces to the street. And there is no regulation. This is the natural thing uh, for uh, businesses to get uh, customers and to get people in. Uh, the problem is this new method that was developed, I think, basically in the 80s, in which you try to capture or you try to enclose your your customers inside of a short uh, enclosed space. And this happens very often in these kind of um, uh, um, station buildings, for example. Um, in the 70s and 60s, not so much, but from the 80s, the idea was that, uh, you know, before uh, before you get out of the station, try to, you know, like keep your attention within, you know, the uh, confines uh, of, of the commercial spaces so that you consume inside there. Uh, but I think this is a strategy that is uh, showing or proving uh, less profitable. And as, as a whole for the business itself and also, also for the operator, for the shopping mall operator and also for the city. Uh, so I think this is slowly being corrected in, in many places. Uh, but yeah, I would say it's, it's, it's more a, a self-organized result rather than the imposition from regulation in this particular case. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question comes from Rayon. Uh, do you think this model can easily export itself overseas? Well, what, that's that's the point of the book. Uh, the whole point of the book is like, why should we? I mean, I'm an architect. I'm not a, a anthropologist. I'm not a historian either. So my whole motivation is to learn how to design. Uh, so uh, that doesn't mean that we can just copy paste things, right? That's, that never works like that. But uh, we can um, get inspired by, by cities. And also we can learn um, from the legal framework, or in this case, for example, from certain uh, characteristics, characteristics of a Japanese uh, planning system. And yeah, I think there are many things that with the necessary adaptations and adjustments, can be exported and why not? I mean, the, I mean, we have been, uh, we, I mean, the Europeans have been exporting many of uh, uh, the ideas about uh, what a city should be, city, uh, what a city should be, etc. And um, uh, yeah, I think uh, this is kind of more or less accepted universally. 
uh, I don't know, American cities or American urban planners, they, they get inspired by Barcelona, by Paris. And why not? I think we can also get inspired by non-Western European models. And I think Tokyo is one example of them. And uh, yeah, I believe there are many things to learn from Tokyo. For example, for American cities, one of the things that uh, I, 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 most of the people, uh, when they read uh, the book and found more interesting is the zoning system. I don't know if you are familiar, but I think American cities are probably much more rigid or strict with zoning uh, than, than European cities in most cases. Uh, zoning means the distribution of uses. No? So for example, in, in residential areas, basically, you can only have residents uh, or, or houses, right? Commercial areas, you only, can only have commerce. But in Tokyo, we see like a huge mixture, like everything is mixture. You can see in a, even in the area which is the, considered the most residential one, this one area which would correspond with the American type, which is like the most residential for basically uh, single family houses or uh, small uh, collective houses. Uh, even in those most residential areas, you are allowed to introduce uh, small commercial spaces, no? For example, like a small boutique, small bar, or uh, I don't know. My neighbor here, uh, I think he uh, or she opened recently um, a kind of school, a small school where she teaches violin. There is a violin classes here, no? So you can transform the first floor of your single-family house into a business. And as far as I know, uh, this seems to be crazy for most American cities. It seems like this is like a completely new thing. Uh, I would say it's not so new for uh, European cities, but this is something that we could, for example, export. And many people in, in the United States, many of my friends, think that it would be like worth trying uh, in order to dynamize, in order to make, you know, this kind of rather, in many cases, like boring, uh, let's say, residential areas that we can see or many people find uh, boring and not exciting to try to dynamize them, allow uh, local businesses, make them more livable, make them more walkable and not to depend too much or so much on the car in which you need to you know, take the car or ride your car for doing anything. So more walkable, livable, uh, kind of more sustainable cities. I think they can be done by uh, making our zoning system a bit more flexible. And the best evidence that we have of that is Tokyo because Tokyo is super flexible and uh, we see the benefits of that flexibility. Thank you so much. Um, the next question comes from uh, DK. Uh, what are the bottom two neighborhoods in this slide? The current slide on your screen. The bottom two neighborhoods in these slides, okay. Um, the, um, the left one is, uh, in fact, is an Ankyo Street. Uh, it's an Ankyo street, it's the, one of those streets that be, were uh, originally were uh, covered rivers and um, they were like um, covered uh, rather in a rush after the war. This is in Ura Harajuku, uh, this is in Harajuku, is the Mozart Brahms street. Uh, so it's a small like kind of, um, uh, maybe you, you know Takeshita Dori, uh, where it's almost parallel to Takeshita Dori. Uh, and this one is a small alley, it's a doji in Kyojima. Kyojima is one of those, um, let's say, like um, popular uh, neighborhoods in Tokyo. And uh, one of the aspects that I mentioned in the book is very interesting how those rather narrow spaces, which are often criticized as uh, very dangerous, etc., dark, they are pretty much uh, used by people they are a kind of en enhancers or promoters or people's interactions there. You see when you go to those alleys, you see people, you see uh, people talking to each other. Very often the neighbors put like lots of small gardens. I, I call it micro gardens along the streets. And uh, uh, they are really, I would say pleasant. No, So I, I kind of acknowledge the need to uh, make a, uh, um, improve the safety of Tokyo. But I think there are also qualities in these kind of tiny spaces. And yeah, that's why I selected these two images as a kind of summary. Thank you so much. 
Um, Martin Garcia Fry asks, I think there's a fine line between order and disorder. I wonder how this is managed in these complex development areas. Can you talk about how this fine line is managed? Okay, you are right. Uh, this, this is a very fine and delicate line and very fragile. So it means that um, it's very easily um, emergence can turn into, let's say, chaos, of course, or they can turn into rigidity. And uh, therefore, I think it's uh, very important that uh, we are aware of the preconditions that uh, actually foster this kind of emergence. For example, um, in these kind of uh, neighborhoods uh, where uh, we can see these kind of small streets uh, and this kind of, uh, uh, well, in Japanese is roji, it's a kind of alley. Uh, very often we see uh, that uh, new uh, and larger uh, condominiums are built all of a sudden. And uh, in this case, of course, those condominiums are safer, but at the same time, they kind of break the, this fragile order in which, as, we, as I was mentioning, people were taking care of the street, people were managing to meet each other along the street, so this kind of community, which community is also an emergent property or thing. So, so it's not, you cannot create community. Community is the result of human interaction. People randomly meeting on the streets, they kind of at the end, they kind of create community. We find a, a loss or, or, or of community. We find a, a decrease of community and community is very important, uh, even more in a situation of aging, right? I think uh, for uh, people who from a certain age, having the support of uh, their neighbors is super important. So we see that these kind of uh, balances and are very fragile. And therefore I think uh, this book is timely in order to kind of, uh, you know, like bring our attention to those kind of very subtle balances that at the end kind of produce these emergent orders. But I'm, it's very delicate. We need, a, do we need to be very refined and uh, we need to, to paint with a very uh, fine brush, I would say. And that's, of course, very difficult also. Thank you very much. We're running out of time, but I want to try to get to a couple more questions, if that's OK. Great. No problem. So Jason Gerber asked, culturally, in what countries could economies of, of agglomeration work? Well, like economies of agglomeration are is a concept of, from economics. It's, it's not something specifically to a certain culture. The traditional example, but usually it's applied to regions or cities. So I am applying it is a kind of in a, in, a, in a very limited way in the sense of I call it micro economies of agglomeration. So economies of agglomeration in a cert, in a, in, a, in the traditional sense, the, the classical example would be, for example, Silicon Valley, right? The Silicon Valley, not now, but now is more like economies of a scale, right? Like really huge uh, enterprises like um, Google, uh, et cetera. But at the beginning, it was really an agglomeration of people working in their like houses and uh, meeting in the cafes. And they created a kind of place uh, where precisely the same kind of people, same kind of, uh, um, you know, the young, uh, entrepreneurs, interesting people, engineers, they were kind of mingling and mi mixing each other. And they started as small businesses collaborating very often, uh, sharing stuff, etc. This is will be one example of an economy of agglomeration. Uh, another economy of agglomeration would be, um, for example, the case of um, the north of Italy, uh, in which uh, it's an amazing case in which we have like many small companies uh, related with uh, product design, you know, like uh, design of uh, lamps, design of furniture, design of all kind of industrial design. And many of those companies are really small. They are not like huge kind of IKEA, uh, super uh, corporate uh, companies. They are family businesses uh, in a certain area, in a certain region. And they managed to be internationally so renowned and so strong because of this effect of agglomeration. It's something that is, has been studied 
in, in economy. And I think we need to understand that one of the qualities of that one of the qualities of our cities is their capacity to create economies of agglomeration through the, uh, the combination or the um, uh, gathering of small businesses in the same place, allowing them a lot of freedom to create and innovate. I think that's something that is very often forgotten or uh, ignored when we replace those dynamic uh, places with small business with huge towers and shopping malls where there is no more dynamism anymore, only franchises and big, uh, you know, big uh, national and international uh, chain stores. Something gets lost, and I think that creativity is precisely what we need from cities. No, that we need that the countryside maybe cannot offer us. That dynamism is what is created through economies of agglomeration, and can be applied to any culture. Thank you so much. Um, maybe this is the final question. No problem. Um, so, uh, Natalia Makohon asks, "How can the reconstruction experiences in Tokyo serve?" serve as an urban model for rebuilding of other countries, for example, the Ukraine? Okay, well, that's a very, um, uh, I think that that question is uh, very, very important uh, because uh, the kind of Tokyo that I'm describing here is a post-war Tokyo. So basically it's a Tokyo that starts in a post-war situation of scarcity in a post-war situation in which um, the Tokyo government and the corporations didn't have really the money and the, the staff, the personnel to reconstruct Tokyo in a more top-down planned way. They tried, they tried. In fact, there are plans after the war, but uh, it was not possible because of this situation of this post-war post situation. So they were kind of flexible, they allowed um, small businesses, small capitals, small uh, business operators to reconstruct the city by themselves. Uh, and at the beginning, of course, in a rather, you know, like very modest way, but uh, slowly they were kind of upgrading their buildings. They were kind of renovating, but without demolishing everything and rebuilding. It was like a gradual incremental way and I think what the Tokyo government and, and Japanese authorities did very well was to concentrate the investment on infrastructure. So you can have you, you have that kind of kind of almost informal urbanization, very uh, kind of self-organized and bottom-up. But then you have a network of super efficient public transport. Now, this is what uh, Tokyo has, right? And you have also a network of wide avenues to allow uh, traffic, car traffic, not everywhere, just you know, strategically and very well planned. So I think this is a combination of centralized uh, planning uh, for uh, public infrastructure combined with, a, I would say, a very loose or I would say like light, light touch approach uh, to urban planning in which basically citizens were allowed to be, to reconstruct uh, things almost by themselves. First, uh, through small houses, then slowly uh, in, they added like some floors, and then at the end they could build these kind of Zakyo buildings, like lower uh, or higher buildings, in a very incremental way, uh, allowing you know the people's resources to be uh, utilized in this process of uh, reconstruction. Thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for all the amazing questions. I'm so sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. There were a lot of really good ones in the chat. Um, but thank you again, Professor Almazan, for your presentation today and taking time out of your day to be with us. Um, and once again, thank you to our program sponsors, the Japan Foundation New York. Um, lastly, I would like to present some upcoming events really, really quickly. But once again, everyone, thank you so much for these awesome questions. Um, it was really fascinating to, to see all of the different kinds of questions that came from this presentation. Um, so upcoming events, please. Okay, so the next Indo-Pacific Maritime Hour is going to be on the Dark Fleet and the Maritime Dangers in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, speaker, Mr. Samar Madani will be the speaker. This is going to be on Monday, October 30th at uh, 1900 Japan Standard Time. So if you have time, please join us for this online event. Let me post it in the chat.
All right, the next Getting to Know Japan webinar is going to be next Tuesday on Meet the Yokai Monsters from Japanese Folklore. Again, it's on Tuesday, October 31st at 10 a.m. Japan Standard Time. This is an online webinar as usual. We hope you'll consider joining us for this exciting and very interesting uh, presentation on Meet the Yokai. Next, please. Uh, the next Community conversation, Conversations event is going to be on Mongolia and its constructive contributions to Northeast Asian security issues. Uh, this is going to be next Saturday, November 4th. They will begin at 1230 with refreshments and the presentation will start promptly at 1315. Speaker Mr. Otogong Batar um, ba, uh, from the Embassy of Mongolia will be the speaker for this event. This is an in-person event in Misawa, so if you are in the Misawa area, please consider joining us for this event. Uh, and lastly, the next Getting to Know Japan webinar um, after the uh, Tuesday webinar is going to be on Thursday, November 9th on the history of the Asia Pacific War. Again, it's on uh, November 9th on Thursday at 1900. It's an online webinar, as you know. Um, so Vice Admiral Yoji Koda will be the speaker for this event. Um, so if you enjoy history, we hope you'll consider joining us for this event. Once again, everyone, thank you so much for joining us each and every week. Thank you so much, Professor Almazan, for your time today. If uh, if you have uh, the opportunity, please purchase his book, um, and hopefully it will answer some more of your questions and, and your interest in uh, Tokyo urbanism. Um, and so we hope you'll see us next time. Thank you once again. Take care. Bye.